On this week's edition of New York Now, a week of state budget talks at the state capitol. We'll tell you what happened. Then, Bernadette Hogan from the New York Post and Josefa Velasquez from the nonprofit news organization The City join me to break down the week. And later, curbing corruption in Albany is top of mind. But how did we get here? Nyberg's Blair Horner explains. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. get another stand. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. So we have come to the end of the road. The New York State budget was due on Thursday, and that didn't happen. And if you were at the Capitol this week, that wouldn't be a surprise. Lawmakers spent the week in a guessing game, trying to figure out what was on the table in the budget and when things would come together. Then, on Thursday, they were told they could go back home to their districts while budget talks dragged on. And a grain of salt here, we tape our show Friday morning, and some stations air as later in the weekend. And there's a chance that something will happen between now and Monday. So for the latest, we'll have real-time updates on the budget on our website throughout the weekend and until the budget is done and passed. That's at nynow.org. And as always, it's all free and there for you anytime. But first, a look back at the week that was in Albany while the state budget deadline loomed and lawmakers scrambled to make it work. Take a look. In the final days of state budget negotiations, one topic continued to dominate the conversation in Albany, the state's bail reform laws. That was after a 10-point crime plan from the Hochul administration was leaked a few weeks back. The plan included tweaks to bail reform, tougher gun crime laws, and targeted investments in violence prevention and social services. And since then, disagreement over how the issue should be handled and when. On Monday, competing rallies convened at the Capitol to make their case. First, a group of Democrats rallied with criminal justice advocates against Hochul's crime plan and in support of a different strategy. They say the answer to the state's crime problem is more funding for social services, like mental health and violence interrupters, not changes to bail reform. State Senator Jessica Ramos. Our civil liberties are being trounced upon for the sake of politics, when we know that due process and a speedy trial is what every single person should be afforded. It's an issue that's caused a rift between Democrats at the Capitol, who control both the state Senate and the Assembly. Some had said that Hochul's plan, which would allow judges to hold more people in jail before trial, could address the rise in crime in New York. Others say crime rates are not tied to bail reform pointing to the national rise in crime and the lack of data in New York. Assemblymember Latrice Walker from Brooklyn has been a top opponent to Hochul's plan. Show us the data, empirical data that supports the 10-point plan that you are trying to accomplish. She cannot and she has not because numbers don't lie. People do. Just feet away, Republicans and members of law enforcement held their own rally Monday to oppose bail reform. They've called for the law to be scrapped altogether, but they've also supported changes that would keep more defendants in jail before trial. They've said that decision should be left to judges based on someone's criminal history or perceived threat to public safety. And they've pointed to anecdotal stories reported through the press to support that position. Senate Republican leader Rob Ort. Every day there's a new video, a new report, a new victim. And our colleagues in the majority not only have no ideas, they put forward no solutions. It's a position that's also had support from groups in law enforcement, who've said they're open to compromise on the issue as well. Washington County DA Tony Jordan, a Republican, is the current president of the state DA's association. It is possible to structure a balanced approach that protects the rights of the accused with the rights of the public to feel safe in their own communities. And that is what we've been asking for the past two and a half years for this body to accomplish. And I think it's doable, and I think it should be done now. Then, on Tuesday, a standstill. Budget negotiations stalled, with no agreement on the major outstanding issues, like bail reform. Things were held up, lawmakers say, 
by Hochul's last-minute crime plan and tension over tax exemptions for real estate in New York City. State Senator Gustavo Rivera. Both of them are big discussions that need to be had, and not two weeks before the damn budget is done is due when we have all of these other things that we've already made so much progress on. That didn't stop advocates from making a last-minute push Tuesday for a few hot-button issues. Among them were a public health plan for low-income undocumented people, greater access to high-speed internet, and more funding for home care workers. And a debate over Kendra's law, a decades-old law that allows court-ordered mental health treatment in New York. Hochul had proposed in January to expand it, giving judges more opportunities to use the law. But advocates and some lawmakers have pushed back, like Assemblymember Mikhail Solage. You know, many of these individuals are crying out for our help and support, and scooping them up involuntarily is not the solution. Right. Right? Right. We need common sense solutions in the fact that we need more funding for many programs that exist. On Wednesday, a quiet day at the state capitol as negotiations continued behind closed doors. Lawmakers made a last-ditch effort for more funding in the budget for things like child care and the home care industry. Lawmakers said at this point, those issues were still on the table, along with changes to bail reform. Senator Ramos again. There's, there, there are rumors of horse trading happening, absolutely. And that's of concern. Well, yeah, of course, because you're, pit- you're pitting people's struggles up against each other, especially when you're politicizing them based on something that data does not even support. And on Thursday, a missed deadline. Lawmakers were told no deal and some went home to their districts. That left top lawmakers and staff in Albany to work through the weekend on a final budget deal with a target for Monday. That's the day the legislature has to approve new funding to keep state payrolls on track. Senate Deputy Majority Leader Mike Gianaris. Um, you think things would have to wrap up pretty quickly to have us come back before Monday. But the controller has indicated that as long as we pass by Monday, it has no practical consequence on state workers or state government. So we have until then. And later in the day, Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins with an update. Things like alcohol to go and relief at the pump still on the table along with the other major issues, like bail reform, child care, and home care. But nothing locked down just yet. It's not one sticking point. There are a lot of issues that are big issues. And, uh, you know, we're trying to get, get them right. And we will. And that brings us to Friday morning. Let's break it all down with this week's panel. Bernadette Hogan is from the New York Post. Josefa Velasquez is from the nonprofit news organization, The City. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for having us. So I want to start with this. So, Josefa, you and I have been covering Albany for a little bit less than a decade. (laughs) I won't give the number of years. And, Bern, you've been covering Albany, obviously, nonstop. So to me, this budget process has been the least transparent since I've been here. And and there are a few reasons for that, I think. Leaders' meetings between the governor and the legislature are happening over Zoom, so we can't catch them in the hallway coming out to say, like, what did you talk about? Right. Uh, Joseph, what do you think that says about this year's process? I think everyone is going into this with, like, uncharted territory because you have a new governor, but you also have all these COVID restrictions in place in the building itself that closes down the hallways where we can talk to assembly members, senators, staffers, lobbyists. And that access is the bread and butter of what we do and how we relay information to the public. And we can't do that. So Mm -hmm. it's really troubling that we're dealing with a state budget that's $216 billion. That's more than like some countries, like gross annual budgets. And we have very few details on what's happening. Right. Just for context, uh, in the assembly specifically, we're usually allowed as reporters to go into the chamber and behind the chamber to catch assembly members on the way out as they're doing things. We're not allowed to do that right now. We're also, uh, we can't see leaders coming out of the room, partly because the hallway is locked a lot of the time because the protesters are around. So it's just a whole... It's, it's, it's a mess, to be honest with you. Bern, how has that changed the dynamic, do you think? Has it changed the dynamic this year? Yes, it has, because again, we're used to a ton of people, elected officials, lobbyists, advocates, walking around, running around the hallways, and that's how you get your source of information. Not just as reporters, but again, all of those different entities. And one thing that Governor Kathy Hochul said when she first took over 
um, well, she, when she took over the governorship, she said she wanted a new era of transparency. Mm -hmm. And as we've seen, the major policy items that were introduced within the past two weeks, the Buffalo Bills stadium deal, that's a multi-billion dollar deal, and also bail reform and changes, massive changes, frankly, to the criminal justice system, have all been introduced last minute. Right. And the governor has said that she doesn't, quote unquote, negotiate in public. Well, she's certainly dropping these deals in the laps of not just the public, but also legislative leaders who had no idea about the negotiations that have been going on for months and months, weeks and weeks before these even were uncovered. And that is a massive problem, especially if this administration wants to have a comparison that they're more transparent compared to the last administration or those before that. Right. She's not negotiating in public, but on these issues, she's also not negotiating in private. It, it, right. Lawmakers told us this week that a big reason why we have a late state budget is because of these last minute issues that she put in the budget. With bail reform, that's, I, it's anyone's guess how that's going to end. Absolutely. And it, I mean, if she wants to get pegged as meet the new boss, same as the old boss, it's certainly, that's what we're, what we're seeing right now. Right. Exactly. And, and I want to turn to the Bill Stadium deal, which we don't have to get into the details of. Yeah. But that is, is surprising to me. I don't think we would see that in a past administration. So we learned on Thursday that from Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart Cousins, that they didn't know about the Bill Stadium deal until the governor put out the press release on that deal. Which is crazy because yeah. as part of the state budget, you don't announce what the deal is until there is a deal because you don't want to show your hand. So the fact that there was this big announcement that was given to the New York Times that, hey, there's, you know, I think it's like a $600 million yeah, budget. Yeah, $600 million from the, from the state from the and state. then 300 or right. so million from Erie For County. For her to announce that via the New York Times before there's been an agreement on it, opens up the possibility that the lawmakers know what she wants and can claw it back or use it as leverage. Yeah. So it was kind of a rookie move for this new governor to just lay it all out there like that. I wonder if politically she was counting on, I'm going to put this deal out and here's the details of the deal. And I wonder if she was counting on politically if lawmakers pushed back that that might look bad for them and good for her. Like she might be strong arming them, but I don't think that that's how it turned out <laughs> so far. Right. I mean, and again, we haven't even heard from her, right? She only put out yeah. a statement yesterday saying we're continuing to work on this budget, even though it's late. But we haven't seen her in public in at least this entire week. Yeah. And, and it also is interesting in timing because, again, that criminal justice package, the bail reform that has been the big sticking point, that was also dropped without any knowledge prior to the legislature, the legislative leaders. You know, it was very much kept in the dark. And then it happens two weeks later with the Bills Stadium. And so I think that totally torpedoed right. conversations, not just with the leaders, Andre Stewart Cousins and Speaker Carl Hasty, but also the members. You have massive backlash mm -hmm. from the left-leaning members who say, this is a corporate giveaway, what are we doing? And then also Republican members, even those who are upstate who have told me and they don't want their names to be shared, but they're like, <laughs> yeah, this is really ridiculous because what are we doing? We're giving away tons of taxpayer dollars on the state end, but also on Erie County's end, which begs the question, what are, what, who are we serving, right? Of course, right. the governor's from Buffalo, the Bills is her home team, but it is all the way at the top of the state. And of course, you can make the argument, who are you attracting? Is this a local team? Again, they lost the Super Bowl. It's not like the Jets or the Giants. <laughs> Just rub it in who, their face, Bernie. No, but, but this is, these, are, these are some of the things that people have said. And of course, uh, you know, you might get flack for this is a downstate perspective, but like, this is a team that it, it is New York's quote unquote only New York team. But right. again, like, what, what, how does this make sense? I don't even think it's a downstate perspective, to be honest with you. Because, and, and I will concede, I think that if the Buffalo Bills moved out of the Buffalo area and they didn't have that football team, I think the economy of that region would take a hit, for sure. Absolutely. But does that justify this deal? I think that's the big question that I people are trying to talk about. I think it's more of like a campaign move. She's obviously, yes. you know, facing a pretty contentious primary and a general election. Buffalo is her base. If those people don't come out to vote for her, she's going to be in trouble because she doesn't have a big profile in the New York mm -hmm. City area. And, you know, Tom Swazi, a congressman is, who's primarying her, is from Long Island. That's another big turnout area. So I think she needs to keep her home base happy. And not to mention, the owners of the bills are billionaires. They have funded governors time and time again, the mm -hmm. previous governor, and now this one. So it makes sense for her to try to give her hometown something. 
So I think you have to look at it from that lens of like, how is Kathy Hochul navigating through this budget, knowing that this is her first election that she's running statewide as governor. So everything comes down to money, donors, and you know, trying to get the vote out and trying to give people a little bit of what they want. And people often think that cities automatically go to Democrats in New York State, but let's not forget back in 2010, Carl about Carl Palladino yeah. took Erie County from Andrew Cuomo when he was running. Mm -hmm. So they, this is a battleground area. And, and if you think that Buffalo is a small slice of the pie, it's really not. It's, it's huge. The, it's, it's one the, of the biggest cities. It's in... the state's second largest yeah. city. So it, there's a lot to get there. And if you look at people like Tom Swazi and Jamani Williams, her primary mm -hmm. challengers, Jamani has way more re name recognition in the city. So it, he has a leg up there. Tom Swazi is a little bit more towards the middle, which seems to be where politics are heading in the Democratic Party for this year's elections. So I guess we'll see how that works out. It, the politics of it is fascinating to me because then you have the Democrats in the legislature who are pushing back on changes to bail reform instead mm -hmm. of trying to come to an area where it looks like they're doing a rollback, which might be politically favorable to them, but they're saying they don't want to do that. Byrne, what are you hearing from people in terms of going into this weekend on that issue? Right. So, I mean, I think there's, there is consensus on both the moderate end and the more left-leaning, we're not going to make any changes end, that there's going to have to be some sort of consensus made. Part of it is a political reason, right? Yeah. We saw Democrats a massive bloodbath on Long Island, frankly, where it's, a, <laughs> it's purple, but you had Democratic uh, Nassau County Executive Laura Kern lose to Bruce Blakeman, a county legislator who no one thought would win. He had no money in the bank, and he blew her out of the water. Same thing with Nassau and Suffolk County DAs. And if that's any indication, oh, and then also the city council races. The city, New York City Council, oh, yeah. which majority is, is Democratic, they were even, you know, almost losing certain seats in Brooklyn, where has typically been, you know, maybe, but have been Democratic. So regardless, if that's any indication of what next year is going to look like, and especially with this perception of rising crime, of course, there have been more high profile cases, especially in the city. Also, not just New York City, but like other Albany, Syracuse, Buffalo, you've had these, these spates of crime and people are like, listen, we prioritize being safe. Mm -hmm. And if bail reform is that massive topic, then they understand they have to make some sort of changes, whether it's gun trafficking, again, what, what are they gonna do about the judges topic? But all those details, they're gonna have to get to the specifics because there's no bill language right now. So what exactly they're gonna do right now is still just talking points. And I gotta say, I think a big problem with this whole thing, the Bill Stadium, the 10 point plan, everything that's going on, the Hochul administration has done a not great job selling this to the public. I think that's what it comes down to is these could be good things for her and for Democrats in this year's mm -hmm. midterms and midterms in Congress and in the legislature, the regular elections. But the public doesn't know why it's good. We're out of time, unfortunately. I'd love to talk about this all day, but we've got to leave it there. <laughs> Bern Hogan from The New York Post, Joseph Velasquez from The City. Thank you both. Thank Thanks. You. All right, staying now with news from the state capitol. After last year's controversy surrounding former Governor Andrew Cuomo, a new conversation began about public trust in government. It's no secret that Albany has a history of corruption and a problem with ethics. And that's been on full display in the last decade. At one point, the Speaker of the Assembly and the Senate Majority Leader were both facing federal corruption charges. They were both convicted, by the way. And the agency that's supposed to police corruption and ethics in Albany, called JCOPE, could now be on the chopping block as part of the state budget, with an eye toward a new watchdog agency. For more on why, I spoke with Blair Horner, who's been working on this issue for decades with the New York Public Interest Research Group. Blair, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So ethics reform has been, I think, on everyone's minds in the past year, given the scandals that happened with the previous governor. And now lawmakers are trying to craft something a little bit more permanent. And I, I want to talk to you about the history of this, because I feel like what gets lost in this is the why. We can talk about ethics reform all day, and I think people have a general sense of ethics in Albany isn't great. But why do we need change in terms of enforcement of ethics? I think we all know why we need some. some yeah, change. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it, you, you start with, you know, why do you want to have speed traps on the highway, right? You want people to follow the law. You want people to drive at the speed limit or at least close. Right. It's the same rule in Albany. You want to have a, uh, an entity that makes sure that people are behaving, whatever the rules are. So you can't take gifts from lobbyists. Somebody's there to enforce it. Uh, you're, you disclose any potential conflicts of interest. Someone monitors that. Somebody does something bad, 
and then that entity goes after them, sanctions them if appropriate, um, and they have to have the power to do that. And they have to be able to do it in a way that's sort of publicly accountable because it's right. a public's agency. It's not some mysterious star chamber. Um, and for years, I mean, I've been involved in this stuff since the 80s. For years, where it always breaks down is lawmakers and the governor, whoever the governor is, are unwilling to create an independent entity, someone who's not necessarily connected to the political party or the leader or whatever, they're unwilling to do that. And that f that's a fundamental flaw. Uh, and we saw it play out a lot with the Joint Commission on Public Ethics where uh, there was a, it was well reported that um, they had a, a secret meeting, uh, which is what they're supposed to have under the law, to discuss what to do about a former aide to Governor Cuomo. Right. Uh, somehow it leaks out to the governor and the governor calls up the assembly speaker and says, you're appointee. Uh, is not following the rules as he sees it with regard to how to deal with that person. That's not supposed to happen, first of all. Second of all, it's, um, it's not the way an agency is supposed to operate. And so the public has to believe this. So, you know, we keep fighting away at it. This year, the governor, Hochul, comes in, and she becomes governor because of the uh, controversies and scandals surrounding her predecessor. She says, it's been reported, that she wants to blow up Jay Cope and replace it with something new. We'll see. So in terms of Jacob, is the problem just that they're, they're appointed by members of the legislature and the governor? Is that the only problem, or do they not have the power that you think that they should have to go after these bad actors? Well, the fundamental flaw is the fact that it's created as a political entity. So, for example, the Senate Majority Leader gets more appointees. Well, the Senate Majority Leader, at the time that the legislation was passed, gets more appointees on the commission than the minority. Why is that? Right. They have more ethics, fewer ethics problems, more ethics problems? I don't even understand. <laughs> it's purely partisan and, and political. Uh, and they're all direct appointees of the people that they supposedly regulate. So that is a fundamental flaw. You can't get past that. that that's where the whole thing breaks down. Um, in t on top of that, of course, they don't have the, some of the authority that they need to, to have, in our opinion. They're not as publicly accountable. They're not required to operate in the public, and so they do so much. They, all their meetings, basically, are in executive session. Um, and so, but those are sort of the kinds of things that you can fix. The, the fundamental problem is it's created not to be independent and to be, in effect, a creature of the people that they're supposed to be monitoring. And that, you just can't get past that. So the governor's proposal in January, she, she wanted the law school deans of the accredited law schools to pick people to, to be on Jacob instead of the current commissioners. Right. How do you feel about that idea? And where, in a perfect world where ethics is perfect, <laughs> we have a, a great system in Albany, where should things end up? Well, the governor's proposal was that the law school deans would be the selection committee that would choose the people that would be on the new entity the governor creates. Oh, so it wasn't one law school dean right. chooses one person. Well, it was well it's, it's, the, it's the 15 law school deans picking five members of this new entity. Ah, okay. And so they had to sort of agree. Now, again, you can make a pretty good argument, I think, that you know they're, they are regulated by the state, too, and this entity regulates lobbying, and a whole bunch of them are at what well, they all have lobbyists. Yeah. And so it... So it was, I mean, it was the governor's idea, so, but the, her idea was that the, um, the regulated shouldn't be directly choosing who regulates them. Mm. And she's right. Uh, in, a, in a perfect world, I mean, I think it should be enshrined in the state constitution because then it makes it harder for people to insert a notwithstanding clause. And for those of you who watch the show may not know what that means, but it's a way to sort of <laughs> put something in the budget that says, well, all the other laws don't matter. We're right. going to do something that no one knows about. Um, or change, uh, and if you enshrined it in the state constitution and you had a funding stream for it, similar to what the, like the New York City Independent Budget Office has, um, you could create an entity that would be independent and where the individuals were selected by someone other than those being regulated. Um, there's, there's different ways to do that. Um, the proposal that um, we've been advancing, because the governor's argument back to us was, well, the constitutional amendment takes some time. Mm. What do we do? Um, and so, you know, some version of what the governor's proposing where there's not direct appointments is key. I mean, the key things for us that we're going to be looking at if they come up with anything uh, this session, direct appointments and political membership, partisan political membership. If those things are there, it's a non-starter. It's, um, you know, it's, it's not quite, and, you know, depending what the proposal is, uh, I view it as just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic and giving right. Jacob a new name or 
putting a mint down on the chair uh, because they're going to make it a little sweeter uh, than they have in the past. But those two, those to us are the litmus test questions. How are they going to make it independent and how are they going to minimize uh, partisan involvement? And we'll see what happens. It's a difficult question. And, and there's also, we have about a minute left. Do you think that it needs more funding in terms of this agency? Was, did Jacob have enough to do what it was charged with doing? Short answer, no. Uh, we actually had to fight with then Governor Cuomo to get the funding for Jacob that they said they were going to give to it. And the same things happened with the Authorities Budget Office, which is another agency that oversees authorities. They never have adequate funding. Even if you create the right entity, you can starve it to death without enough uh, resources. Right. So we never thought that Jacob had enough resources, and we've been pushing for an increase in resources in whatever new agency, if there is one. Uh, that comes out of the budget process. We think it makes perfect sense to be creating a new agency within the budget process, because after all, you have to spend money on a state agency. Right, funding is attached. Right. All right, well, we'll see where things head this session. Blair Horner from the New York Public Interest Research Group, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So we'll see if lawmakers come up with a replacement for Jacob in the state budget. And just a reminder that by the time you're watching this, we might know more about that. But either way, catch up on our website. Again, that's at nynow.org. We'll have real-time updates there on where things stand. In the meantime, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.